We're very honored to have Governor Wolf give the keynote speech at this 12th or 13th annual budget summit. We never quite know which it is. And it's my pleasure to introduce him. It's very hard to introduce someone everyone knows. You know what he does currently, you know what he did before, you even know what kind of vehicle he drives. And after our analysis of his, of his most recent budget this morning, you know that he's been prescient about the problems facing our state, problems that have been revealed to everyone by the COVID-19 pandemic, and you know he's put forward bold programs to deal with those problems. I could tell some humorous stories about the couple of times we've met, but given his tight uh, time frame, I'm just going to thank him for joining us and turn the program over to Governor Tom Wolf. Hey, th thank you, Mark, and especially thank you for not uh, sharing those uh, humorous stories. I'm, I'm not sure what they were, but thank you. So it, it's a real pleasure to, to be with all of you. Uh, you are passionate advocates for the policies that most people find uninteresting. But you know that budgets are not only important, but they're central to the way we wanna uh, make our world. And thus, you know that budgets are in fact actually very interesting. <clears throat> you know that budgets matter for real people. They're not just abstractions. Behind those numbers and the budget, including mine, are real people and real families and real communities and real businesses and a real future. And these people, these families, these communities, these businesses, they all face real barriers in the past of the futures that they want and the futures that we actually need them to have. We're all in this together. That's the point. To the extent these barriers lead to frustration, to anger, even surrender, those barriers ultimately hurt each and every one of us. And so this budget is aimed at removing barriers that exist for everybody in Pennsylvania, barriers that keep real Pennsylvanians from the future they want, and that even more critically, they're barriers that keep all of us from the future that we want, and I think we deserve. So let's start with some broad sense of what a budget is. I, I don't wanna to get too academic here, but a budget is, is both a statement of moral purpose and a roadmap to a set of preferred practical outcomes. Too often, we separate these things, I think. Thus, some look to the budget and policy preferences that they express as a purely moral document. And there is an element of that, but it's not purely moral. But when they look at that, it looks uh, to, to issues really um, almost exclusively of things like fairness, inclusion, and equity. Uh, in the process, there's an implication that I think is unfortunate, that these things have a place that is separate and apart from the world as it really is, from the real world but also that the better moral world, world is one where it's sort of a zero sum game that we have to deny ourselves something to get there. So I want a better life for you. So I'm gonna content myself with uh, a less than perfect world for me. On the other side are those who see the budget as just a hardcore, no nonsense roadmap aimed at maximizing something, I don't know, like GDP and relegating all other considerations to the side. The idea is that if you want a world of killer apps and internet innovation and economic dynamism, you don't really have time for moralizing. You're just indulging in sentimental dreaming, caught in a zero sum game between the real world as it really is and the feel good world that you'd like it to be. My budget proceeds from the assumption that this is a false dichotomy, that there is no trade off, that this is not a zero sum game. The truth is the future we want is rooted in both moral and practical preferences. It turns out that a strong economy depends on things like fairness and equity and inclusion. It turns out that income distribution actually does matter for a dynamic economy and that competition and risk is important uh, and that fairness matters to those things. In this, my 21-22 budget pays tribute to a lot of very formal economists of the past from John Maynard Keynes to Thomas Piketty. Uh, who, who basically saw that, that, that economics is, to a certain extent, a science. There's a lot of math in it, but it's also uh, expressing human preferences. And, and we need to, to figure out how the world uh, it, 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 the, that we want, how we're going to gain that. And, and a budget is, is a way to, to get that. And included in that are things, are preferences of, of, of our life. There are ethics involved. Uh, behavioral economics has figured this out. So people like the Ernst Fair have, have discovered that if you want employees to, to do well by your customers, then you got to do well by your employees. Uh, conservative economists like Luigi Zingales at the University of Chicago, they figured this, this out too. If you want a really 
strong, functioning, free market economy, you got to have a lot of things that, that, that are actually that actually pay tribute to things like fairness. And the general idea that a free market is a lot, you know, this is what I think. I mean, I like baseball, but it's sort of like a, a game. Uh, if, if you really want people to participate in the game, you can't have rules uh, that are unfair. You can't have a, a tilted playing field. So my 21-22 budget tries to bring together practicality and ethics. It begins with a view uh, of a young Pennsylvania family. Let's assume two parents and two children. They live in a rural or they could live in an urban part of Pennsylvania. They're plagued with barriers. They have car payments to make. They have insurance payments. They have rent or mortgage payments. And maybe they even are paying off some old student debt. <clears throat> they might've started a business which is struggling to get its sea legs. Uh, they're forced to send their kids to schools that because of the zip code they live in, I mean, remember they're young and, and starting out, because of their zip code, the schools that they send their kids to don't have the resources they need to provide the education they want their kids to have. They travel over roads and bridges that are not really all they should be. And their neighbors are struggling with substance use disorder and other intellectual disabilities, mental health issues. They're all uh, uh, part of uh, 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 problems and barriers that they're facing. And, and then we haven't even gotten to uh, the health emergency that might just completely disastrously swamp the whole family. So let's consider the consequences for, to, for us of, of this family's situation. <clears throat> this is not some family out there. This affects us. And that's what my budget tries to su suggest and try to, 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 to take into account. This, this family certainly doesn't want any additional financial burdens. I get that. Uh, they don't want it for themselves. They don't want it for their small struggling business. On the other hand, they don't want to be devastated by poor schools or bad roads or bridges falling down. They don't want to be faced with the dire consequence of a, of a looming health emergency. And it may be just a matter of braces for the kids or a tonsillectomy. And they don't want to feel all that they, they don't feel, as a result of all these barriers, they don't feel all that energized by a free market economy whose rules always seem to stack the deck toward a privileged few. And for some reason, they're not included in that privileged few. Nor do they feel all that encouraged by a world that will probably offer their kids a life that is less promising than the one they thought they were uh, gonna have when they started out in life. The result is they might not wanna play the game. The result is an opportunity cost for the rest of us. The result is their kids don't want to play the game either. Either, So they're really not trying to have a better life than their parents. In fact, they don't think that's possible. And the appetite for risk, the things that we actually need for, for a, a dynamic society and economy, that doesn't exist because the, the rules are not fair. If enough of our fellow Pennsylvanians feel this way, they might even throw a whole system out. It might not be something that that we, we uh, want to see. So the goal is to chart a course that gives the maximum scope for human creativity and energy and achievement and risk-taking while creating a reality that encourages the maximum number of people to play in that dynamic innovation rewarding game. And that's what this budget aims to do by creating a fairer tax system, by providing the public goods and thriving society needs like education and training, real options for, for folks, like infrastructure, including broadband and transportation and mass transit, and by mitigating random and catastrophic risk, like providing broader, not universal health care, health insurance, by establishing a basic income level that does not create a starting line that never allows people to really enter the race. And that's where the minimum wage comes in. So let's start with the, the tax system. Right now, as you know, Pennsylvania's tax system is one of the most unfair in the entire country. And I know the folks at the Pennsylvania Budget and Policy Center are all too aware of this. For years, you've been fighting for a fair, more equitable tax system, and you're right. Working class and low-income families pay exact, we have a uniformity clause that forces all of us to pay the exact same tax rate as the most well-off in our commonwealth. Asking Pennsylvanians who are struggling to get by and support their families to pay the same amount in taxes as the wealthiest Pennsylvanians, well, as you know, that's wrong. That's why my plan calls for a modest raise in the personal income tax with an accompanying increment, expansion increase in the existing special tax forgiveness credit. This is all 
uh, in, in line with uh, rulings that have come out of the Supreme Court. It's right in line with the uniformity clause. It's been in place really since the, the early 1970s. And if we do it the right way, this will raise taxes for less than a third of Pennsylvanians, while two thirds of Pennsylvanians will either see no increase in taxes or a real decrease. That small increase for Pennsylvanians who have already made it will help us invest in an education system that prepares all of our students for success. That helps all of us. Same time, we'll be able to lower taxes to help Pennsylvanians just starting off to build a little bit of security for themselves and their families at the time when they're most vulnerable. Getting Pennsylvania back on track after the pandemic also means getting Pennsylvania back to work. It means investing in the businesses and workers that drive our economy. And it means developing a sustainable solution to support long-term economic recovery. My workforce development plan called Back to Work PA will foster economic recovery by investing in our businesses, in our workers, and actually directly in our communities. But there's more that we can do and that we should do. One of the most important things we can do to help workers and businesses and our economy is to wage, raise the minimum wage in Pennsylvania. Right now, the minimum wage in our Commonwealth is not a livable wage. It's a disgrace. It's the federal wage of $7.25. Other states, including red states, red states like Florida, are already on a path to $15 an hour. And every one of Pennsylvania's neighboring states have raised wages above the federal minimum. Pennsylvania workers are being left behind. And all of us, not just the workers, but all of us are suffering for us for it. This isn't about pitting workers against business owners because businesses also stand to benefit from a higher minimum wage. Increasing the minimum wage puts more money, consumption dollars into the pockets of workers, which gives local businesses more customers. Boosting wages also increases productivity. It decreases turnover. Remember, I was in business before I got this job as governor, and, and nobody uh, gets uh, prosperous in business by stiffing your workers. You just don't, it doesn't happen. Raising the minimum wage allows Pennsylvanians to work their way out of poverty. It saves tax dollars. Actually, it also produces tax dollars. Think of all those people who are buying things or they pay sales and use tax. They pay an income tax. And that's why I'm proposing that we increase Pennsylvania's minimum wage immediately to $12 per hour, at actually effective July 1st, 2021, with increases of 50 cents each year until the minimum wage reaches $15 per hour on July 1st, 2027, and thereafter it's indexed to inflation. Increasing the minimum wage to $15 per hour will give more than 1 million hardworking Pennsylvanians a raise. And it will help our workers, businesses, and communities thrive in a post-pandemic economy. You can make whatever assumptions you want about how many people would get how much more uh, over a period of time, but a million people times, uh, let's say, $2,000 and a dollar an hour increase comes out to about $2 billion increase aggregate demand in Pennsylvania. I think that's a conservative estimate. It's a lot of money going into to, uh, uh, places that, that can use an extra $2 billion in sales. These investments in people and communities will help us get back on track. But there are also uh, uh, things that are going to help, again, all of us. Um, now let's get back to, to other things. Pennsylvania's faced barriers other than, than this before the pandemic hit. Uh, and most of those problems are actually worse now than they were before the pandemic. But one of the big ones has to do with education. One of the biggest things that holds Pennsylvania's back is a lack of access, equitable access to high quality education. Uh, we have um, economically segregated our communities, racially segregated our communities, uh, and that's why fully and fairly funding every public school in the state is a cornerstone of my budget plan. Every child in Pennsylvania deserves to get a good education, but chronic underfunding of some schools has deprived many of our students uh, of the resources they need to serve uh, to, to get the, the education that they need. The fair funding formula was first enacted in 2016, which is great. It was a major bipartisan achievement and it was intended to fix the problem of great disparities between school districts. But unfortunately, that fair funding formula was made to apply only to new investments in education. So I've increased education dramatically since I've been governor, uh, but that's that one point whatever it is, billion dollars that we've increased uh, basic education, uh, that's all that goes out according to the fair funding formula. The bulk of the money that comes from the state is still uh, not according to the fair funding formula. And here's what that means. 
Despite the major population shifts in school communities over the past 30 years, 89%, 80, almost 90% of state education funding is still based on student counts in 1992. Think of that. The money that we distribute and allocate from the state to help local school districts is based on student population in 1992. And distribution is based not on actual costs, but on how much funding a district received the prior year. This is the famous hold harmless provision. So what that means is growing school districts aren't receiving enough funding to meet the needs of their students, especially in lower income communities. And that forces school districts to raise property taxes in an effort to close the gap between what the state provides and what their students need. So now take this on the, on the surface, you'd say a property tax is actually a progressive tax. Well, it's not. By economically segregating our communities, we hollow them out and create you know, islands of poverty. And that means you have a low tax base. So your pr property tax rates are, are, have to be high because the, the, the tax base is, is low. That means we have a tax that the people who pay at the highest millage rate are actually getting the least for their buck, for their, their millage rate. Uh, and you can go across the, uh, the street in places like Philadelphia, my own hometown of York, uh, and actually have a reduction in your uh, property tax millage rate, but see an increase in the, the, the resources that your school district has. So Pennsylvania's school district, uh, your school funding formula is just structurally unfair. It's failing students, it's failing teachers, it's failing all of us. And I want to restore fairness in school funding to ensure every community has the resources to provide students with the quality education we need them to get. I'm proposing that we run all current state basic education funding through the fair funding formula, 100%. That way funding will finally reflect the actual costs of educating the students in every district. To make it successful, I am also proposing a 1.3 billion investment. This is where the uh, progressive income tax comes in. 1.3 billion investment in education funding. 1.1 billion dollars of that uh, is intended to ensure that no school will lose a single dollar. So I'm holding harmless every school district out there. No one's going to lose a buck. I'm adding additional, I'm proposing to add an additional 200 million dollars that will ensure that every school district gets a funding increase. So we're funding schools fairly in my budget and add, and and increasing the funding that they're getting. This plan also ensures that districts with shrinking enrollment are protected from a cut that will, and they're actually gonna get an increase this year. Because no matter where you live, every student, every single student deserves the opportunity to succeed. And we recognize that schooling, education is a cornerstone to that success. Pennsylvania's charter school, we need to do other things too. Pennsylvania's charter school law is among the worst in the entire nation. This is another opportunity for, for funding for our public education system. My agenda for the year calls for changes to the way our Commonwealth's broken charter school law works. I, I wanna hold underperforming charter schools to account, uh, but I also wanna make it easier for low income students to, I'm sorry, to, to, uh, to attend, to have the choices that charter schools provide, uh, but I want it to be uh, done fairly, uh, to hold the charter schools to the same standards that we hold our, our public schools, traditional public schools. Uh, and this is gonna produce hundreds of millions of dollars of savings to local school districts who are now paying through the nose uh, to charter schools uh, that may not be giving uh, the students uh, what uh, the uh, school districts are expected to give. And, and this would restore accountability. Uh, my agenda and the budget also calls for changes to uh, our, the way we uh, support students who are going to college. The rising cost of the higher education and the debt it forces students and their families to take on is a huge barrier for Pennsylvanians. So I wanna provide more opportunities for Pennsylvanians to get a college education. And I wanna do it in a way that will encourage talented, creative Pennsylvanians to stay right here in Pennsylvania once they graduate. And that's why I'm proposing the Nellie Bly Scholarship Program. This is a needs-based tuition uh, help that, that uh, will uh, help students cover the costs of everything, not just tuition. Uh, but also room and board, book supplies, and graduation expenses. To be eligible, a student at one of our 14 state system of higher education schools needs to agree to live in Pennsylvania for the same number of years that they got the scholarship, the stipend. If they decide, if they change their mind, they decide they want to leave Pennsylvania before that point, then the tuition will convert to a low interest uh, rate uh, student loan. To pay for this program, 
I'm proposing that we redirect $199 million in money that's already being spent, taxpayer money from the Pennsylvania Racehorse Development Trust Fund. I mean, it's the easy thing to say here is, and I do say it, that I'd rather bet on our students than line the pockets of out-of-state racehorse owners. This money goes into purses for, for racehorses. So I'm sorry I've taken so long, but this budget envisions a Pennsylvania that, den that denies the false choice between prosperity and ethics. It says we need both. And that's not ideology, that's reality. We humans are con conditional reciprocators as behavioral economists have shown. Uh, and our instinct is to treat others fairly, but we expect to be treated fairly too. And if we aren't treated fairly, we're not gonna treat you fairly. And if we're a part of a system that doesn't treat us fairly, we're not gonna be uh, happy to be part of that system. Uh, thus, a system that fails to recognize this truth will not succeed in the not too long run. We need to recognize this truth in our public policies. We need to balance the creative, innovative, sometimes disruptive energies that deliver the goods and services we enjoy in our modern world with the barriers, uh, with the fairness that the uh, people who participate, the human beings who participate in that system need to, to have to be willing to participate. And that's what this budget is trying to do. So thank you and Mark, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Thank you, Governor Wolf. This is Jeff Garris. I'm the Outreach Director at Pennsylvania Budget and Policy Center. And that's okay. okay. <laughs> um, I, uh, I'm fielding some questions here that <clears throat> folks are submitting via the chat. I'm gonna try to go through these as quickly as we can uh, because I know your time is limited. First question we have is from Marion. Marion's question is, uh, rural areas hold forests and fields that provide clean air and water as free ecological services. How does your budget bring equity to rural areas? Um, the, the, well, first, there are, that's, there are a lot of facets to that. I mean, education is one. One of the things, I'm not sure, it's actually, it's a great question. I'm not sure it's in the budget, but, but part of what I want is, the, is, is to have Pennsylvania join the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which would actually create uh, money for communities that, that have, uh, and many of them rural communities, and like the community I live in, uh, that, that has uh, um, you know, carbon emissions, uh, and that, that, that would actually uh, have the price of say electricity generation include that, that externality in the, in the price of, of, uh, of electrical generation. But I think we also need to, to continue to, to uh, make sure that, that we protect the, the forests that, that are the lungs. Pennsylvania, I mean, Penn's Woods, forests are really important to us. And I think uh, we learned back around the turn of the century when uh, Gifford Pinchot was the national forester that that uh, it's all too easy to, to destroy this, this uh, uh, resource that actually provides a lot of good things for Pennsylvania, including clean air uh, and, and clean water. So uh, th this is important. Uh, and and uh, the hope is whether the, the things that we're doing with the Department of Environmental, Protect Environmental Protection are part of the budget, uh, all of that uh, is, is a real important priority for me. Thank you, Governor Wolf. And thank you, Marion, for submitting that question. Good question from Katie. It is, can the governor say exactly how he expects the federal stimulus to affect Pennsylvania's budget? Have there been conversations with Republicans about this? Where does the governor see potential political sticking points? Yeah, here's, here's the, one of the problems I think is, that, and that's why I said that, that we're still doing school funding that is based on 1992 population statistics, except for the new money. Um, I think there's going to, the, the federal stimulus, I'm really happy that it's that Pennsylvania will get over $7 billion, the state government directly, and schools will get, I think, another $5 billion. And then that doesn't include a lot of other things that will be coming. Uh, and then there's a, a, an infrastructure program that the president says is going to be uh, worth trillions of dollars. So uh, I, I think financially, um, we, we have a good partner in, in Washington. Almost counterintuitively, um, that takes away the discipline that I think we were looking at here in Pennsylvania. Say, okay, we've had about a 30 year structural budget deficit. And by that, I mean, there are things that we have really said we want to consume, but we haven't been willing to pay for, it. like highways, like bridges, like education. You know, all those things that actually contribute to a, a really good economy and a, and a society. And the 
pandemic was really a, an opportunity, I think, to, to think creatively, which is what I tried to do to say, let's, let's basically take a, you know, uh, a uh, tax that is meant to be uniform and, and see if we can bring some progressivity to it, some fairness to it. Um, if the federal government is going to give us $7 billion, I can guarantee the Republicans are going to say, let's continue to kick the can down the road. And I think that's that's unfortunate because this was a heaven sent opportunity for us to say, let's let's do the right thing here. Uh, and and I think um, accepting just accepting and, and using this to plug a, a structural budget deficit for another two years is basically just kicking the can down the road. And 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 I would be sorry for that. Uh, and it would be some future administration that will have to face up to the consequences of our not taking uh, real decisive action here. Thank you, Governor, and thank you, Katie. Uh, we have a question here, it's kind of picking up on this uh, idea of uh, one administration having to maybe deal with questions from some or problems from some of the previous ones. The question is from uh, Margaret, who says, thank you, Governor Wolf, for repairing the damage done by your predecessor. I know there is a long way to go. How can I, as a concerned citizen from Erie County, best help you get the budget passed? Well, that, that's where elections have consequences. Uh, I was so hopeful that, that we could maybe make a change in, in this, this election uh, so that we could actually get started on, on this. As you'll recall, part of the reason I got elected was because my predecessor had basically said, I'm not gonna raise taxes. And what he translated that into is I'm gonna stiff education. Basically, it, it, it made local property owners pay more in taxes. So there really was a big tax increase. It just wasn't at the state level. Um, and I'm afraid that's what's going to happen here, that we'll take the Fed, because, you know, federal money was taken during the, the 2008 Great Recession. And the same thing will happen here. And, and two years down the road, uh, whoever my successor is, because uh, I, I, I'm, I'm term limited. Uh, and uh, sometime after January 2023, when I'm out of office, that General Assembly and that governor, whoever it is, whoever they are, will, will have to deal with this uh, intractable problem. Uh, and sooner or later, that structural budget deficit is going to bite us all. A bridge is going to fall down. Uh, I, I mean, I think it's it's gradual enough on the education side that maybe people sort of become immune to it. You know, I can still go across this street and be in a school district that has the resources my kids need. But, you know, increasingly, that's going to be impo we're just impoverishing ourselves. Um, and if you want a sense of that, you know, have an exchange student come in from from uh, a place like Japan or France uh, or Germany. Um, one of the questions they ask when you bring them from the airport to wherever you're taking them, um, back when I was a kid, they would look with admiration and say, you guys, how you have roads that are amazing and bridges and schools and all this wonderful stuff. You can drink water out of your tap. Now, uh, I don't know if you have, any of you have had exchange students from any of those places recently, but, but the reaction I get is what happened? What happened here? I mean, we don't see it because we live it day in and day out. But if we keep kicking this can down the road, uh, it's going to get worse and worse. Uh, and um, I, I, I tremble for, for, for what the, the future of Pennsylvania is going to hold if we don't get our arms around this soon. Thank you, Governor. Time for one last question. Okay, uh, we have a question from... Uh, our friend and ally Janine at Project Home. What is your plan to end homelessness and make sure Pennsylvanians have access to affordable housing? Yeah, I, uh, groups like Project Home have really, uh, uh, I think, done a phenomenal job. We, we have a greater understanding of how important a shelter is and a home is to a whole host of, of problems. Uh, and the, 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 the issue of homelessness is, is really something that I think uh, we need to get a lot more serious about. I think the uh, uh, affordable housing uh, programs that are out there are doing really good work, but they're basically just trying to keep up with, with uh, a problem that, that just is much greater than, than the supply of solutions that, that we have. So that, that's, that's a, 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 an issue that, that I think we, we have to figure out. I, I believe that the federal government is 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 under has a greater understanding of that. Uh, this might be something that that uh, has uh, a, a federal component uh, to it. Uh, 
but uh, I, I think it's something that 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 we need to do a much better job than we're doing. I need to do a better job than, than I'm doing. Thank you for taking the time to answer these questions. And uh, thank you to everyone who submitted questions. Sorry, we don't have time for all of them. And I'll turn it over to uh, my colleague, Mark Steer. So thanks, Jeff. I just want to thank Governor Wolf um, for his, his remarks. Uh, turns out we didn't really need to do the budget analysis earlier this morning since he gave it to it to us and basically focused on the highlights as we did. And we're very grateful that we're all on the same page on this. And uh, I, we, we thank you for the bold budget you proposed and we agree with you, what you're saying about the need to deal with the problems and uh, not push them down for the next administration, deal with them. And we're gonna work with you to make that happen with all of our allies on this call. Great, well, thank you, Mark. And thank you everybody for, for letting me uh, um, give the keynote here. I appreciate that very much. Good luck. Thanks. So I think now I'm going to turn it back to Jeff, who uh, uh, has a few more things for us to do today, including uh, talking about what's coming up in the budget summit. Thanks, Mark. Um, yes, we're going to wrap up here uh, with giving you a little preview of what's coming up. Earlier today, we uh, had our opening plenary session with Mark Steer and uh, our colleague Diana Paulson uh, doing the uh, presentation of Pennsylvania's uh, Pennsylvania Budget and Policy Center's uh, analysis of the governor's budget proposal. You can find a copy of that report and the slides that were presented this morning. And you can watch a video uh, of this morning's presentation if you missed it by going to the Budget Summit webpage to uh, the Whova app as well. Uh, all you need to do is go to the agenda, uh, scroll down, find the opening plenary session, click on that. You'll find links to download those resources, links to watch the video as well. Uh, you will also be able to go on that agenda page and look at what we have coming up in the weeks ahead. Uh, today, this is the final plenary session for this week, for this Thursday, but we will be back online the next three Thursdays. And on all three of those Thursdays, we'll be at the same time that we started the session this afternoon at 1 p.m. We'll be going from 1 p.m. to 2.15 each of the next three Thursdays, Thursday, um, March 18th, Thursday, March uh, 20th, sorry, <laughs> Thursday, March 25th, and then we'll be ending on uh, April uh, 1st. And we're not fooling about that. We, we really will be wrapping up on, on that uh, Thursday, April 1st. So we're gonna take uh, just a couple minutes here before we wrap up to give you a little bit of a preview of what you can expect in the weeks ahead. Each of the next three weeks, as we, I mentioned, we're doing these workshops. There will be two workshop sessions uh, taking place at the same time each of the next three Thursdays. I've invited the people who are moderating and putting together these workshops for the next three weeks to join us here uh, in this session to give you just a very quick preview. You can look at those on the agenda. You can click on it. There's more information there. We'll continue to add more. But I wanted to hear, have you here directly from the folks who have been putting in a lot of thought and work to putting together panels on topics that we think will be of interest to a lot of you. And again, you can only go to one because they're at the same time, but we will have videos of every session available on this webpage. So you can pick one, be there live and watch the other one afterwards if you'd like. Uh, our first person who will be speaking about this uh, is doing a budget summit next Thursday at 1 p.m. This is our friend and colleague the Executive Director of Education Voters of Pennsylvania, Susan Spica. Susan? Hi there. Um, hope everybody is doing well today. So our uh, panel will be called Inadequate, Inequitable, and Unconstitutional Pennsylvania School Funding System. And we are delighted uh, to have two attorneys who will be joining us um, from the Public, Education Law, Public Interest Law Center and Education Law Center uh, because this year, the school funding lawsuit in Pennsylvania will be going to trial. So we will be giving you a deep dive into everything you wanna know about Pennsylvania's broken school funding system and the lawsuit that we can expect in the upcoming months. And then at the end, we'll take a quick look at the charter school reforms and Governor Wolf's budget proposal uh, and then have a lot of time for questions and answers. So we're really excited. And I hope a lot of people will join us. So thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Susan. Um, 
Another workshop that's taking place next Thursday is one on one of the issues that uh, was touched on today and one of the questions that the governor addressed related to housing problems in Pennsylvania. Uh, and I'm pleased to have here with us to talk about this. Uh, the person who's putting together this workshop is one of our uh, newer colleagues here at the Pennsylvania Budget and Policy Center, our Associate Director, Milana Landecker, who uh, comes to us from having been previously at the Housing Alliance of Pennsylvania. Lavana. Thanks, Jeff. Hi, everyone. My name is Lavana Landecker, and like Jeff said, I'm the Associate Director with the Keystone Research Center and the Pennsylvania Budget and Policy Center. And I'm really excited about the panel that we're going to have next week on housing. I do think that it is such a critical issue for us to focus on, um, especially as Governor Wolf said in light of the pandemic. I think all of us have gained an appreciation um, in ways that we could not have imagined for having a safe place to stay at home. And we're gonna talk, uh, our panel is called The Scope of the Housing Crisis in Pennsylvania and the Policy Solutions to Solve It. So we are gonna have three amazing panelists. First, we're gonna have Andrea Menino from the Housing Alliance to talk about the scope of the problem, the depth of the affordable housing crisis here in Pennsylvania before the pandemic and how it's gotten even worse during the pandemic. Uh, we are going to have Senator Nikhil Saval to talk about housing uh, policy solutions from uh, what's moving right now and what we could potentially even see in this session to um, big ideas that are being pro uh, proposed by the Progressive Caucus um, and um, some practical solutions that we're looking at um, specifically in working groups with the bipartisan support around eviction and some other key issues. And then our third panelist is going to be Stephanie Sina from um, who is the anti-poverty fellow at Villanova University. Uh, she also leads the student run Emergency Housing Unit of Philadelphia. And she's been working with people who are directly experiencing homelessness and organizing themselves um, to create uh, housing. And so we're gonna talk about creative solutions, things that people are doing on the ground and ways that we can address homelessness here and now by providing uh, permanent housing. So I think it's gonna be a great panel. I hope you guys all join us. I look forward to seeing you next Thursday. Thanks, Lavana. So there's two options next week are the workshops on education and the workshop on housing. Two weeks from today on Thursday, April 25th, uh, we will have two workshops as well that are both beginning at 1 p.m. Um, first workshop we're gonna talk about is one that really addresses some longstanding problems with inequity in Pennsylvania. And Mark Steer is gonna to talk to you about that one. Thanks, Jeff. We're gonna have uh, two, uh, two state legislators join us as well as perhaps some members of our staff to talk about racial equity. It'd be, it'd be Representative Donna Bullock, who's the chair of the Le Legislative Black Caucus, and uh, a new representative, Napoleon Nelson, who's been working on a project to, uh, to present to people an analysis of the deep racial inequities in various areas of public policy in the state. Um, this is something we, uh, as our, in our own team, has been delving into much more in recent years, and we're really pleased to be joining Representatives Bullock and Nelson to talk about uh, all the ways, well, maybe not all the ways, many of the, the ways that, in which public policy in Pennsylvania uh, reflects deep-seated white supremacy and how we can start addressing the, the, those public policies and, and fix them and create a truly just, inclusive, equitable Pennsylvania. Hope you can join us. Thanks, Mark. Um, the other workshop taking place at 1 p.m. two weeks from today on Thursday, April 25th, is a workshop that's really looking at uh, the contributions that folks who are immigrants to Pennsylvania and immigrants from around the world are making to Pennsylvania's economy and how to support that. So I'm going to turn it over to our senior policy analyst, uh, Diana Paulson, to talk a little bit about this. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so I'm really excited about this workshop. This, um, the title of the workshop is Supporting Campaigns for Immigrant Rights in Pennsylvania. And in this session, we'll be hearing about, you know, both current and pending legislation that is designed um, to improve the quality of life for Pennsylvania's immigrants and for all of us, really. Um, and we'll 
specifically be talking about um, tuition equity and access to driver's licenses for undocumented immigrants. And we're gonna hear from our own um, research analyst, Mesa Murtaza, who will share um, some research that he's done on driver access to driver's licenses in Pennsylvania and the, the many contributions immigrants make to our communities. Um, we'll also be hearing from amazing leaders of the Driving PA Forward campaign, CASA and MILPA, which is the immigrant or movement of immigrant leaders in Pennsylvania. So we hope you'll join us for that. Thanks. Thank you, Diana. So uh, two great workshops taking place two weeks from today, uh, looking at racial equity and how to strive for that in Pennsylvania and talking about uh, supporting campaigns for the rights of immigrants in Pennsylvania. Thanks to Mark and Diana for giving a quick preview of that. The final week and the final day of our budget summit is Thursday, April 1st. At 1 p.m., we will have two workshops coming up. Um, we're gonna hear a bit about one of them now from our director of campaigns, Kadita Kenner, uh, talking a bit about the work that she does in this workshop that's coming up three weeks from today. Kadita. Thank you, Jeff. Good afternoon, friends. Uh, my name is Kadita Kenner. As Jeff mentioned, I am the director of campaigns for the Pennsylvania Budget and Policy Center. And I have the privilege of moderating one of the two workshops on the final day of the 2021 Budget Summit. Um, today, we commemorate the one-year anniversary of the COVID-19 global pandemic impacting and changing our lives. And in turn, we also had to change the way in which we organize, mobilize, and engage our friends, neighbors, and fellow constituents to take action. And so uh, the We the People campaign, which is the advocacy arm of the Pennsylvania Budget and Policy Center, was a very early adapter as we pivoted our efforts uh, to highlight our progressive legislative agenda from the libraries in which we were doing this, or the schools or the meeting rooms, to Zoom and teletown halls and other digital platforms. So we hope that you join us and two of our most powerful grassroots organizational partners for a workshop entitled Organizing and Mobilizing During a Pandemic, Pro Tips from the We the People campaign and our partners. And so this workshop will present creative ideas and tactics for mobilizing advocates and activists during the coronavirus pandemic when social distancing and other necessary protective measures um, are needed and necessary. So presenters include We the People staffers, including our Deputy Director of Campaigns, Katie Personette, Organizing Associate Ricardo Almodovar, and we're delighted to have Leila Martin, the senior organizer from CASA, and Kat Baccarani, the environmental justice organizer uh, for One Pennsylvania, join the conversation. So we hope that you join us on that final day, Thursday, April 1st at 1 p.m. Join the interactive panel discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Kadita. Sounds like a great workshop. Uh, the other workshop that we have three weeks from today on April 1st, is a workshop being led by the executive director of the Keystone Research Center, Steve Hertzenberg. Steve? You may need to unmute yourself, Steve. I do, sorry, thank you, Jeff. I said no one No one told me I was gonna be up against Kadita. Um, uh, no, I'm kidding. Um, the Reimagine Appalachia campaign launched last year in Southwest Pennsylvania Southeast Ohio, West Virginia, and Eastern Kentucky, ah, the Ohio River Valley, to develop a unifying vision of aggressive climate response that working people, unions, and the 99% would see as a big win for economic opportunity, for communities, for the environment, and the planet. This workshop will tell you the Reimagine Appalachia story and outline the campaign's vision of a new deal that works for us. Today, the Reimagine campaign brings together a powerful and growing coalition of labor, grassroots groups, the racial justice community, environmentalists, and others. Our workshop, led by Amanda Woodrum of Policy Matters Ohio, uh, co-director of Reimagine Appalachia, and by me, will focus on the extraordinary federal advocacy opportunity that exists in the next few months on infrastructure and how you and your networks can plug in. Our region can help achieve a bigger federal climate infrastructure plan that brings more of its resources to our region. This could allocate hundreds of billions to North Central Appalachia, create hundreds of thousands of good union jobs, and light a fuse that leads to that new deal that works for us. 
check out the Reimagine Appalachia webpage, its Facebook page with lots of Facebook Live videos, and find the Reimagine Appalachia campaign video. Watch it, like it, share it, and then join us April 1st. Don't be an April fool. Okay, thank you, Steve. I'll, I'll give it a try. Um, hopefully the rest of us will too. Uh, so uh, great workshops coming up three weeks from today. Uh, thank you to Kadita and Steve for giving us a little preview of that. And to the rest of the folks who uh, walked us through the workshop options taking place over the next three Thursdays at 1 p.m. Uh, and again, uh, if you're not able to make it one of those weeks or there are two or three that you wanna uh, be at at the same time. Well, we only have two at the same time, but uh, if you want to be at two at the same time and, and can't do it, uh, you can go onto the Budget Summit webpage uh, and onto the Whova app where you will be able to watch videos of sessions that have already taken place, including the plenary session this morning, uh, as well as the governor's uh, keynote speech, which we're so glad that he was able to join us to do. Now, that third Thursday uh, from three weeks from today uh, on April 1st, following those workshop sessions that Kadita and Steve were talking about, we're going to wrap up the budget summit with a final closing plenary session. Uh, we'll give a little break between the workshops, about 15 minutes, and we'll be starting at 2.30 on Thursday, April 1st with a legislative panel discussion. We will be spotlighting and having with us several of our leading progressive champions in the General Assembly of Pennsylvania. Uh, we'll be talking more about them and sending information out via the app and via email over the next few weeks. Uh, but that conversation will be moderated by Corinna Wilson, uh, our friend who's served as moderator at our in-person budget summits over the last few years. And Corinna always does a, a great job on that. Corinna uh, will be also taking questions that are submitted by the audience and posing those to the legislators on the panel in that final closing plenary session on Thursday, April 1st. That'll go from 2.30 to 3.30. And uh, you know, we've, we've had to make some adaptations to the way that we've done our budget summit uh, in the past uh, for this year in light of the pandemic. But hopefully um, you know, we'll be able to be back together in person uh, a year from now. But in the next three weeks, we'll be back together online uh, Thursday, April 18th, Thursday, April 25th, and Thursday, April 1st all of those for workshops at 1 p.m. And then on the first, that final closing plenary at 2.30. Uh, again, thank you to all of my colleagues for participating today. Thank you to Governor Wolf and to his staff and team who made it possible for him to be with us today uh, to answer questions folks here were posing to him. We also wanna thank all of the folks on our tech and comms teams who've been helping us to um, figure out how to use this new technology. And thank you especially to every single one of you who participated today as an attendee, who registered and who joined us for this. We look forward to seeing you on the next three Thursdays. Thank you all so much. Have a great day, everyone. <laughs>